So let's get started here. I'd like you to, um, there's been a lot of obviously going on uh, with midterms and Thanksgiving break and so forth. Um, really important part of learning is to sit back sometimes and just to take a look at what we've covered. So think for back for a minute what we've looked at over the last class, particularly Friday's class. Take half a minute or so and just, uh, you don't even need to flip back through your notes. What are the things that you remember from last class? So just take a minute and think, think to yourself what that was. And talk with the person next to you if you feel that's a better way for yourself. What did we cover last class? What do you recall? Okay, so perhaps uh, one thing that you might have realized by just doing that is how little you actually remember. Right? It's, and that's a normal part of our, of, our, of our lives, especially given the situation you're in where you've got multiple classes every day. And it's the reason why I always start the class with a review of about five minutes or so where we recap of what we covered last time. Because we recognize that that's a normal part of our brain is to forget some of these things. So, but between all of you, this, you've probably got a good recollection. So let's just shout out some of the things we learned last time. We learned about flux. Okay, we gave it a symbol. J. Okay. Anything else related to that? What else do you recall about our discussion? We had about a, a 10 minute discussion on that topic. What were some of the important issues related to flux? Why is it so important? The flux is proportional to the the resistance is proportional to the thickness of the membrane. So that was an important sub-point here. So resistance is a function of the membrane thickness, L. Call it LM. Anything else that affected flux? Driving force. Driving force. Okay, so... What is the driving force in this case? The pressure, the pressure gradient. We gave a specific name to it. TMP, transmembrane pressure. Okay. So our driving force, delta P, also called the transmembrane pressure in the membrane literature. What else was the important um, topics around the flux discussion? Okay, to get a high driving force, we'll get a higher flux. To get a higher flux, we would like a, a lower resistance. But we can't get that always because a lower resistance implies thinner membranes and those membranes start to fail at high pressure drops. So you, you're really um, pushing the bounds of that material structure. Okay, so a lot of important discussion there around that topic. The other thing I really wanted you to have remembered from last class, which um, hasn't come up yet, was that case study we looked at, and we looked at it in terms of the membrane equation. There's really only one equation that covers this entire area, the general filtration equation, where the flux is equal to delta P 
times the fluid viscosity and we have two resistances, the medium's resistance and the cake's resistance. Okay? And the important point that you should have remembered from that case study we looked at last class was I showed you how we can calculate RM. We did that. How did we do that? Anyone remember? I know it's Tuesday, it's been a long weekend, but we, we need to start to gear up for the week. Yeah. Use pure water or pure fluid. So we're not, not putting any material in there that will cause a cake resistance to build up. We're using a pure fluid, and then we know all the other terms in that equation, or at least can measure them. We can measure J, we can measure delta P, we know our viscosity, so we can calculate RM. And then the cake resistance can be calculated as well um, once we know RM in a similar way. Okay? So a lot of important topics covered in last class. I'll just put up the, that key slide over here. Now, this equation isn't, isn't new to us. We've learned about this in the filtration topic. So this structure is, is very, very familiar to us. And we were then looking at that example, as I said, that case study where we showed how to calculate the medium's resistance in part one and then the resistance due to the cake buildup in part two. Part three asked us to estimate the delta P we would require to get a certain flux. So this is your boss asking you, for example, that you'd like a flux of 0 0.035 kilograms per second per meter squared. And once you know R, M, R, C, mu, you can calculate delta P. Okay, so that, that question was really straightforward. I didn't cover it in class. I just give you the answer. But let me, let me take it a step further now. Now your company is starting to sell this product, and it's really successful. And you need to produce more of it. In fact, you want to go from 0 0.035. You want to triple production. You want to go to 0.1 kilograms of that. How can you do that? Can you achieve those fluxes now? So the answer is right here. We increase our pressure, we'll get an increase in J. Okay. Why is that? Why don't I have to worry about mu, rm, and rc when I increase pressure? Because of the tangential flow. This is the key distinction between filtration and membranes. In membranes, we have a cross flow. Just go back a few slides for this illustration. This cross flow shears the solids off the surface of the membrane on a continual basis. We, in fact, we feed this fluid at a very high velocity. That's definitely turbulent flow, right? The Reynolds number there is extremely turbulent one meters per second, these tubes are very, very narrow, the spacing there, I'll show some illustrations in a few minutes. Certainly turbulent flow that keeps that solid moving along the surface of the membrane. This is the visual that you have to have in your mind, is that that solid buildup there is roughly constant. If I increase the pressure drop through that, that doesn't change the solids buildup. The only thing that can in fact change the solids buildup is if I feed a more concentrated feed of solids in there. That's the only, th only way I can get an increased cake resistance. So RC is not affected by delta P. RM is not affected by delta P. Mu is not affected by delta P. So if you're asked to triple the flux through that membrane, the simplest way is to simply triple the pressure. But take a look here, though. In the previous problem, the pressure required to get this flux of 0 0.035 was 325 kPa. So if we're tripling our flux, we're tripling our pressure drop, we're now up to about 1,000 kPa. And one of the numbers you should remember when it comes to microfiltration is that that's likely not supported by the microfiltration membrane. The driving forces typically experienced in microfiltration are in the order of 100 to 500 kPa. Okay? So remember that problem-solving strategy. Define your, your goal, 
explore the equation, plan, do, and then the fifth option is to check. There's your check. We can't have these unrealistic driving forces. There's, there's the range that you should expect your answers to be in. Okay. Now, I did want to take a little um, time to talk a bit about that membrane structure. It's not um, in the slides they're explicitly written. I normally talk about it, but let's just write up a few notes because the medium in a slide in, um, in a membrane is really the critical aspect. So let's just make some notes about the medium. The medium is, of course, the MSA that restricts the flow of one of the species. So if you read um, membrane literature or textbooks, there isn't really an agreed on definition for what the medium is. About the most general way we can state it is that it's the device, the mass separating agent that restricts the flow of one of the species. Right? It's, it's incorrect to say the medium is a polymer that filters the, the liquid from the solid. That's not true. Not all membranes are polymers. Membranes can be made from a variety of materials. You, they can be made from glass, ceramics. They can be made from metal. They can even be a liquid. A liquid gel can be used as a membrane because it restricts the flow of one of the species through it. And the most common, of course, is a polymeric material of some sort. But these other options are possible. And what's really interesting, where you start to get into some of the, the technology side of membranes, is when you start to put a charge on that membrane surface. Okay? Think, think what the objective of membranes are, is to separate one species from another. Well, if you can lay out positive or negative charges, or neutral, as most often the case. But if you can put a positive or negative charge on the medium, you can start to do some interesting separations. So that's used in, in um, electrodialysis, for example. So you can repel one of your species away from the medium. and force it to stay in the retentate, to move away from the, from the medium. Okay, you can also start to add, if you're dealing with polymers, you can add functional groups. So back to your organic chemistry, you can really engineer that surface of the membrane with some interesting functional groups to either attract or repel species of interest. And then the most key distinction that we will use is we will define our membranes as either symmetric or asymmetric. So just a quick uh, word on, on symmetry when it refers to the membrane. You'll notice here um, the last two images are called symmetric membranes. Well, the reason why they're called that is because when you look at them, it's the beginning of the membrane looks the same as at the end of the membrane. There's no real way to tell one side apart from the other. The first image that you see here is an asymmetric membrane. So just a quick um, general diagram that you might want to note is that symmetric membranes If you looked at any cross-sectional area, um, you see these sort of pore-like structures passing through in that random fashion. In an asymmetric membrane, what we have is 
that same pore-like structure, but there'll be this supportive layer. Well, I actually shouldn't call it that. There's this base layer. The counterintuitive part here is that, in fact, this pore-like structure is the support, and it's this part that is actually doing the work. of separation. By that I mean is that the material flows in that direction. Okay. So in this particular illustration, that very fine, dense area is what's causing the separation. The pores, those finger-like structures that you see there, that's actually the support that's giving it the structural support to withstand the pressure differences. So that can with withstand the pressure differences those finger-like structures present no real resistance. There's no real medium resistance there. That open porous structure simply allows anything to pass through it, but it is providing the structural support for this very, very thin layer um, to do the work. Okay. So we'll see those distinctions between um, uh, in membranes when it comes to sym symmetry. So perhaps, um, let me just jump, this is quite a few slides on in the notes. I'll get an illustration of that. Okay, this is in ultrafiltration, but also applies equally well to microfiltration. If we take a look at um, this cross section, these are hollow fibers. And that paper clip gives you an idea of the dimension. If we zoom in on one of those hollow fibers, you see the asymmetric structure there. The material is fed on the interior of the hollow tube. That's your feed side, is this side. And so that very thin layer over there is doing the work. The rest of this is simply providing the structural integrity for the, for the tube. And because it's so porous, it allows, it allows anything to flow through and presents no real resistance. So you can, you can understand now when you start to put high pressures in here, there's a large pressure difference between the interior and the exterior. And it's this outer layer that's, that's withstanding the pressure gradient. And it's simply a support for the inner layer. Okay. Any questions on that so far? Okay, now I'd like to um, just we go back to a slide that I had skipped over at the end of last class, and that's this one over here, slide 23. Now, there's a whole lot of build-up to get to this slide, which is not here in the actual notes. So let's, um, let's take a look at various flow sheets. This is where we'll end up. But how we end up there is by considering various flow sheet configurations. And the most basic membrane flow sheet would be one where you've got your feed material. and you're pumping it, we need a delta P, remember, so that comes from a pump, and we're sending it to a membrane. And the most typical way we draw these membranes is as a box with a diagonal line. So my feed comes in, and I have a permeate and a retentate leaving. So one stream in, two streams leaving. The permeate is the part that goes through the membrane. And if you visualize this diagonal line to be your membrane, the permeate then would be that stream over there, and the retentate 
leaving in that way. <coughs> okay, and we have a, a very obvious name for this, for this flow sheet. It's called the single pass configuration. Okay, so you've got a feed that's continually entering and this membrane is configured in the right way to get the desired permeate flows and concentrations and the right retentate flow and concentration. But that's not often the case. What we will see next is I'll show you a different uh, continuous configuration. But let's take a look at a, at a batch approach. A batch approach is often used when we're purifying biological compounds. Uh, any one of you working in the pharmaceutical or biologics area in the future, that entire industry is predicated on batch processes. Um, very inefficient to some extent, but historically it's done that way because of the way that that industry is regulated. So traceability of being able to trace one lot of material and distinguish it from the next lot of material almost enforces that that entire industry of pharmaceuticals and biologics works in a batch manner. So they've got that traceability from one batch to the next. On a continuous basis, you don't have traceability because you, you get mixing and you can't tell where one change in the process affects the final product. But in a batch process, we have that. And so our batch configuration then looks, as you would expect, you've got your feed coming in and you put it in a tank. So you fill this tank up, close the valve, and now you're ready to process it. And the way you would process it is, again, you need a pump to provide your delta P. You've got your membrane over there, and your permeate leaving, and your retentate is recycled around. Okay, so our retentate stream is, cir is circulated over and over. And you'll process this in this batch manner. So this is a batch configuration. Until you get the desired separation. So your solids that are being circulated around here eventually build up in concentration over time. You probably are interested in the permeate in most instances. And so that permeate then gets withdrawn and used in the next stage of the flow sheet. And the retentate is simply recirculated and may be discarded if it's not of value. Sometimes it is of value and then that can be processed again in a secondary step in the flow sheet. Yeah, but it's definitely a batch operation where you, you circulate and operate that for a given period of time. Now, I'm going to take that and I'm going to turn it into a continuous process with a very small change. So you may wish to redraw this diagram. But essentially, the difference is very minor. We recirculate and simply withdraw off a portion over there. So you would have valves then to control essentially how much you want to withdraw in your retentate stream versus what you're recycling. Okay, and that's essentially what's shown up here now, is what we've ended up with, is on this slide. 
with a few more um, valves and sensors shown to illustrate where we measure pressure. And I will emphasize here in this flow sheet, we have the pump, of course, to provide the necessary pressure drop. But there is an alternative way to provide the delta P required. It doesn't need to be provided by a pump. I could, as an alternative, here at the permeate stream where my laser pointer is, apply a vacuum and have my tank here at ambient pressure and draw a vacuum there on the permeate stream. And that will also provide a delta P. Okay. Of course, by doing so, you limit yourself to a maximum delta P that's, that's just short of one atmosphere because you can't draw a vacuum from ambient to zero pressure. Um, you probably couldn't even get to 20% to of that. So really, your total delta P possible if you're drawing a vacuum is about 80% of one atmosphere at the very, very most. Whereas if you're pr inputting here at, with a pump, you can go to much higher delta P's because then you really just don't care what's on the other side. Okay, so two options are available. Either you supply the pressure, and this is great because you can do this at really high TMPs, high delta Ps, or your second option is to draw a vacuum. But um, either way, you need to set up a delta P there. So take a look at that flow sheet now, and I want you to consider that flow sheet from a batch perspective. So let's go back to the batch configuration. Okay, and that's very easy. I can convert this continuous flow sheet to a batch flow sheet by simply shutting this valve. Right? That remember that was the only change I made when I went from batch to continuous was by adding that stream. So really I can operate this continuous flow sheet in batch mode by closing that valve, but I'll emphasize it by simply deleting that line. Okay, so that's back to batch mode. And here's what I want you to think about. As a function of time, remember batch, batch systems, this is why we looked at batch processes in reactor design. Batch systems are by definition very much time dependent. So let's take a look at what happens in the system over time. I'd like you to plot for me over time, what you would expect your flux to look like. What would that flux in that system look like over time? Discuss it with the person next to you. Okay, so any suggestions for what that curve would look like? Flat line, Devin? Um, would the activity flux increase at first and then come to a, come to a, a flat point where it's constant? Are you getting more build up to a point where it's steady state? Right? So flux will decrease till a point where you get a flat line and it's constant. Does that seem reasonable? So something like that, perhaps? Any other suggestions? Would it reach zero? What's happening in this batch system? Yeah. 
Okay, so the suggestion there is that it will eventually reach zero, but you likely would have stopped it and cleaned it out before then. Okay, right, and that, so that's true. For a batch system, yeah, we can absolutely guess that it will eventually tend to zero because you're left long enough, you're going to just clog that membrane up with solids. Okay, so now do you see why we would operate in a continuous way by adding that stream? Right, so remember from recycle, 2D, 2F, why we have recycles in our processes, but also remember the idea of inerts, right, being trapped in a recycle loop and never being able to leave and building up. If we're allowing our solids to leave there, we would expect that we get something like that. Okay, so on a more continuous basis, we'll get that and eventually operated long enough that will also tend to clog up the entire membrane but over a much longer time frame. So this does, it still tends to zero. Okay, eventually. Now I'd like you to consider that same operation, this, uh, the second red curve, but what happens if I, if I increase the flow rate so I operate this pump at a faster throughput. How is that next curve likely to be different? What might happen, Dylan? Start with a higher, higher flux. We'll be, so we're starting with a clean, let's assume we start with a clean membrane. I'm operating at a higher velocity, higher flow rates through there. Okay, so generally we'll start at the same point and then end with, with this. So this is higher velocity. Okay. Now, we've, in all three of these, we've got the same problem. That membrane is building up and it's clogging eventually over time, right? So. As an engineer, what can you do about it? Another way of saying that is that flux drops because if we look back at our flux equation, J what's what's changing in there over time? Eventually that cake resistance is it's clogging up because we've got the solids building up over and over in there, higher concentrations of solids coming through. And remember I said solids concentration is what's affecting RC. So RC is affected here because we've got an increase in solids concentration over time. As an engineer now, what, do you, what can you do about this? There's, a, there's at least four or five ways to get a higher flux. Remember that's always our goal, higher flux. What can we do? Some suggestions. More pressure drop, okay? So we can go operate at higher delta P, so that's gonna cost us money, operating costs. So that's, a, that's a valid option. Something else? It's kind of a long shot, but it, depending on what like, the actual material that's clotting uh, or the medium, could you add something that would quickly like, dissolve it? Okay, can we add something into this tank perhaps and feed it through to dissolve the solids whatever's clogging the medium up, okay? So they're, they're, that's an option. Maybe you stop the system, put your cleaning agent in there and clean, clean the membrane up, okay, by dissolving those solids away, okay? Any other suggestions? Reverse the flow through the membrane. Okay, so the suggestion here is stop this process and pass your material this way through the membrane. So now you're going, and essentially you're blowing out your solids, moving them away from the membrane. Okay, and you can use fluid to do that. 
or as shown here, compressed air. Okay. So periodically, we'll shut this valve. You close that permeate valve over there where my laser pointer is. Open up your compressed air, send it back into the membrane. And what you would do here, in fact, you'd also close this valve. You don't want to send material back this way. You close that valve and you force your material back this way, back into the tank. So any solids that were built up on that membrane surface get back flushed back into that feed tank. Okay. So it's a very common operation to periodically, and this is done in an entirely automated way, you have a system that monitors your flux or your flow rate, stops when it drops off, and back flushes. And so what you end up then with is a pattern that looks like pattern C. So you've got your regular cross flow with back flush. Okay, so periodically then we'll get the sort of same trajectory down and then we back flush. Same trajectory down, back flush. Same trajectory down, back flush. Okay. And what that does is it allows you to operate on average so now you're operating on average at higher fluxes. Okay, so there's a short change over period where you're not producing anything here because you're back flushing. You've got those valves configured so that the solids are being blown back into the tank. But then on average you get much, much greater throughputs. That's usually based on monitoring flow rate. You monitor the flux. So yeah. So once that you Basically, you set that bottom point when you get to an unacceptably low flux. So is there like a, a standard? Like if it drops to 70%, you'll have much of the There's no standard. It, it would be entirely what your demand is downstream. Right? So you know what subsequent steps come in your flow sheet yeah. and what flows they're expecting. And so you want to provide those flows to them on average. Okay. Now, you would obviously expect that that sawtooth pattern eventually degrades over time as well, right? The membranes are not um, entirely 100% replenishable, so you'll back flush, but that sawtooth will eventually, eventually drop off down. And that might be when you stop and do a chemical clean, right? So here we're simply using a mechanical process to clear our membrane, but it might be that once a month, once a quarter, that you need to stop the membrane and chemically treat it to dissolve and remove any solids. Okay, some other exotic options are possible. Um, there's ways of using electric current in, inside a membrane. Um, you can, this, this suggestion here of increasing the temperature of the feed is actually a really poor suggestion. You would never do this in practice because membranes, particularly polymer membranes, do not operate under high temperatures. They do not withstand high pressures very well. In fact, it would be very uncommon to see a membrane that operates at greater than 50 degrees Celsius. So higher than 50 degrees Celsius is typically not seen in practice. And so the change in viscosity that you get by raising the temperature is so negligible that that's not really an effective way to improve the flux. So ignore that suggestion or cross it out. Okay. You may also, and this is now where the creativity comes in, is start to sequence up a variety of units. Right? So we'll see this um, in the next section, but it might be a good point to illustrate it now, is that, for example, in cheese, in cheese making, there's curds and there's whey. If those two words um, are not familiar to you, just uh, look them up. But essentially, whey is a liquid-based derivative from the cheese-making process that's got all sorts of interesting proteins and sugars dissolved in it. And whey is extremely valuable. I mean, there's the cheese that we recover from the, from the curds, but the whey, the liquid side, also has value. But we will never put whey directly in to a membrane. Okay, whey contains these dissolved fat molecules from the cheese making process. So there's leftover fats. And those leftover fats, the very first thing that they're going to do is come into your membrane and clog it entirely up. So you will never, never put 
a membrane right as the first separating step. So what we will do though is put a centrifuge first. Okay, so I'm going to draw this just as a generic block, our centrifuge, and remove our fats first and then send the liquid that we've removed the fats from to our separation step. Okay. So in whey processing, essentially what's inside here now are dissolved sugars, lactic acid, water. Okay. But we've removed our fats primarily in the centrifuge step. Okay, any leftover bits of cheese um, that weren't separated out, that messy feed is first centrifuged to separate out those solids and those fats. Okay. And what we'll see, in fact, in the next topic is we'll use ultrafiltration to do this step. Uh, we'll cover ultra, ultrafiltration as our next topic. And we get a permeate stream now and we get a retentate. Okay, both of these streams are valuable. The retentate stream will contain very valuable proteins. Okay, so dissolved sugars, I also, I forgot to mention here is uh, proteins. This is why the stream is in fact so valuable, is some of these proteins can be recovered. They, those are retained in the retentate. Those are large molecules. Okay, relative to the dissolved sugars, relative to the lactic acid and the water, the proteins are large, high molecular weight molecules. They do not pass through the ultrafiltration membrane. So they're retained in the retentate. The permeate then contains dissolved sugars and lactic acid, and that gets sent to another membrane, which we'll learn about next week, reverse osmosis. Okay, so this reverse osmosis step has, again, a retentate and a permeate. Okay, and then that, that final re reverse osmosis step, the retentate um, contains essentially very high COD. This is very high COD liquid, but it's now in concentrated form, and you can deal with that before you discharge it to your wastewater stream. And then the permeate is the valuable part. It contains some of these dissolved sugars and lactic acids and is in fact used to make ethanol. Okay. So cheese making has a lot of sub products that are of high value. Yeah. What does COD stand for? Chemical oxygen demand, sorry. Bio, for the bio students know what that is. Chemical oxygen demand. Uh, this is material that uh, you cannot discharge into your municipal wastewater. Um, you have to pre-treat it first, but it's primarily water with organic compounds in it. Okay, so what you're starting to see here in, in, the, in this course is that our units are not in isolation of each other. No separation unit will ever do a perfect job on its own. We always sequence, <coughs> sequence it up. And if you recall right back to the very first class in... Um, this course, I'd said that if you looked at most flow sheets, 75% of the units in that flow sheet are separators. And this is the reason why. No single separator on its own will do a perfect job for you at the level that you require. So we have to sequence them up and we use the advantage of each of these units. For example, centrifuges, you can put fat and cheese into it and it doesn't clog up the centrifuge. It throws it out to the edge and you can open up, like you saw there in the video in the earlier class, and remove those solids. But a membrane, you can imagine that a fat molecule uh, will not do very well passing through um, some of these pores. They will get trapped in there and essentially just clog up that membrane surface. Okay, so essentially what we've covered here up to this point in the slides are the entire topic of microfiltration. Um, all these slides cover that topic, and they, uh, so microfiltration starts here on slide 19 um, and ends at about slide 20, 
27, is it? No, 28. And then the topic of ultrafiltration start, starts on slide 29. So that's where we will take the next section up from. The midterm is up to and including uh, the slide prior to this, so ultrafiltra um, on microfiltration. Um, I do also want to mention that Wednesday's class is a really critical class. Many of you tend not to come to the class on the day of the midterm. But uh, Wednesday's class, I would like you to be here because, as I've mentioned, a former student that was in 4M two years ago, Sean Johnston, who now works at GE in the membranes area, will be giving a guest lecture and will be making a membrane for us here in the class. So that will be kind of neat to see. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that point. There's a few minutes left, and I'm happy to answer any questions up to now that you might have.